Good evening. I'd like to start this final session of the day by thanking you in the audience for staying and congratulating you because you're in for, I think, one of the most relevant sessions that you will hear during the three days of the conference. If you could take your seats and stop talking, we could get the show on the road and we can all get to dinner. But as I say, I'm quite excited by this panel because it's going to discuss for you this evening practical applications of much of what you've been hearing about both here and elsewhere of in artificial intelligence and digital connectivity. And we have, I'm excited about this because we have a panel of pra practitioners, of people who are really involved in the industry of the internet of cars, the internet of airborne vehicles, and the internet of space and space communications. What we have here is a panel that will be discussing the way you live and things that you do in everyday life and I guarantee you, when they have finished, you will understand a lot better what the future holds for you and the fact that the future is actually now. We're going to talk, first of all, about automobiles and other methods of surface transportation. And to do that, we're privileged to have Monsieur Francois Barrault who is the head of something called DigiWorld, which has put out a series of publications that Francois has shared with me that help you understand what a transformation the digital era has brought to our daily lives. Francois, tell us about the Internet of Cars. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, it's a bit hard for all of you, I know. This is the last presentation. You've seen a lot of numbers, concepts about technology. I would like to start by what does it mean for us? Because at the end of the day, um, we are here to create together a better world and make sure the governance fits with that. I'm going to give you a few dates. 2006 and 2009, my two boys turned 18 and the nicest day of their life was to have their driving license. They had it the very day of their birthday. In 2015, I bought a Tesla. And I bought a Tesla, which is a high-end luxury car, on the net with my credit card without any interaction with a sales guy. I couldn't negotiate, by the way, because the machine didn't, didn't want me to negotiate. So th this was for me a great experience. In 2016, I organized a congress like that on connected car, and I went to see one of my dear friends who is the CEO of a very large car manufacturer, and we started to talk about connected car. And I really wanted to talk about connected car. At the end of the day, what we did, we talked about smart mobility. Why? Because he told me, you know, Francois, five years from now, not sure we're going to produce car, or are we going to transport people? 2017, 2016, uh, my daughter turned 18. So I say, what about your driver's license? license? She say, I don't really care. 2017, she turned 19. I say, what about your driver, driving license? You say, but dad, I have Uber. Well, she has my account of Uber. Let's put it that way. <laughs> and you know what I mean? She uses it a lot. Or oh, I have blah, blah, car. And you know, I don't, I don't care about cars. In 2017, I'm selling all my petrol cars and keep only electric cars and smart cars. So 2007, remember, 2008, remember, nine years ago was uh, the appearance of iPhone. So in nine years, so many things happened. I see five things who have transformed our life. The first one is usage. The main thing that internet has brought to people is the commodity of knowledge. Knowledge has been in books, in university. The boss, when you were the boss, you didn't share your knowledge. But now, with the internet, knowledge is a commodity shared by everybody. 
So you, you are not smart because you know rather you know better than another. You're smart because you share. And the young people and internet has put us in the sharing economy. You share pictures on Facebook, you share your experience, and everybody shares. So owning something is good, but sharing something is much better, especially with the young generation. Second is the development of technology. Uh, with the explosion of the fiber, the 3G and 4G, the power of iPhones, with the power of the cloud, you have access to everything anywhere. The geolocalization allows to buy something where you are or order a car. And the technology has dramatically changed um, the, the, um, the picture of where we are right now. Third is sense and symbol. When I talk to our kids or young people, the students, when I teach, uh, sense makes a lot to them. They don't want to be or work uh, in an environment that do not care about the planet. They do not, I remember all my life when my three kids went out for my Range Rover. I was very proud to have a trophy car and say, Dad, too much oil, we don't want to travel in, into this car. And the other point also is car is not anymore something to celebrate to success in life. It's a commodity. I remember when I got my driving license, my first car, it, it was something very, uh, very important to me. Four, emergence of new trends. We always, um, we spend a lot of time, of course, in the traffic jam, but also there is emergence of smart cities um, and smart cars and whatever you call that. I was in Riyadh last week and there was this big announcement about NEOM, the 500 billion US dollars investment into the next generation city. It's around smart cities. It's around uh, uh, eco-carbon. And now everybody talks about smart cities and it's a, it's a plan as a state level. And last, it's ubiquity into, in terms of choice of what you want to do. As an example, if you want to go from A to B on Google Map, you can walk, take a train, take a bike or whatever. When you order Uber, you can take a small one, a big one. If you go to London, you have six different um, categories. So in nine years, there has been a huge revolution driven by technology, driven by sense, be, uh, driven also by the abandonment of some symbol. Just a quick slide. I don't like slide, but this is um, quite interesting uh, to see. If you can launch that, not the previous one. I just want to uh, give you a short update on where we are on connected cars. There are three types of connected cars. The most advanced by far is Tesla. Tesla has not only a 3G uh, card in it, it has intelligence, it can drive by itself. Last week I drove between Brussels and Paris, 240 kilometers without touching uh, the steering wheel. And I came in, in Paris as relaxed as my wife and I could do SMS, I know it's forbidden, but really, I was cool. The second type of connected car is car with some technology inside, but your uh, iPhone or smartphone is a, the kind of modem. And the last is your smartphone, because the, smart, the smartphone embarks so many uh, technology with you. What would look like the next generation autonom autonomous car? It will be like a saloon. You will be comfortably uh, sitting in it. You have seven types of um, autonomous car. And again, here, Tesla is something, is the, is the brand which is the most advanced. By 2021, we'll start to have a lot of cars autonomous. And it's a me too strategy driven by most uh, of the car manufacturer. I like um, this slide because it, it, it looks like what the future uh, will be. There will be different types of connected car. There will be connected car where they're connected together or connected car, smart cars connected with the environment. Each of us has been, has been to some emerging countries where in the center of city you have 3,000 different objects so you have 
donkeys, you have bicycles, you have cars, you have trucks, and there is zero accident. Why? Because they all are connected to, to, to each other. The donkey is connected to the bicycle, is connected to the truck, the motorbike. If you take 3,000 connected cars, it's the same. They will have a software between themselves with a hierarchy with rules. There will be never an accident. If you have 2,999 cars, one donkey, there will be an accident. So you need to connect things with some algorithm, some logic, so that they can, be, uh, they can live together. You will see in the near future a big acceleration. You all know what is the Moore's law. The chairman of SoftBank last week announced the million. The speed of connectivity will be uh, increased by one million. The speed um, of treatment of information by one million. And the capacity in the cloud to treat inform information will be uh, also increased by one million. That means that all the cars will have a huge software hardware infrastructure, will have real-time access uh, to the cloud, and in the cloud, there will be trillion lines of code that will make us safe when you travel, identify the danger, identify the quality of the road, or any obstacles. So we're not there yet, but it will be very soon. Thank you. Pascal, thank you, um, particularly for guiding us toward an understanding that cars in the future are likely to be not a product that we buy, but a service that we employ. That's a major shift uh, for our societies. And your confession of wrongdoing sets up very nicely the second part of uh, our topic, which is governance, uh, which is how do governments react to the astonishing technological changes that we're dealing with here. In the United States, for example, um, there are laws that regulate that you have to have a seat belt and you have to have an air safety bag, but there's no law about whether you have to have a driver or not. Clearly laws are going to be updated, and this is a major topic. Uh, our next speaker has a lot of experience in dealing with governments and safety regulations and safe, the culture of safety. Uh, it is Patrick Kastelbijak, Kastelbijak sorry, um, who is the head of strategy at Airbus. Patrick? Um, and um, and so I will I will first say my, my kids are a little younger so so I think they dream of flying cars so I'm, I'm so I'm afraid we're going to speak a little bit about this because not so long ago this was something even I thought three four, four years back I thought this was something maybe my children will see but but actually this is happening and and this is what I'd like to talk about is uh, urban air mobility is is we we discussed that this morning Jim and he said we need to understand a little bit where we're coming from but. What we're talking about basically is about vehicles flying people vertically in cities from, for, for example, downtown to an airport or point to point. And, and you ask me where this is coming from. And I think it comes from different things. First, it comes from a need. And the need is a simple one is we all know that uh, we're going to, I mean, urbanization is a very large phenomenon. I mean, we, we, we are more than half of the population now living in urban areas. Over the last 10 years, every single day, roughly 200,000 people move from rural areas to urban ones. 200,000 people per day in average, imagine. So yes, the cities are growing bigger, but also what is growing bigger is the traffic, is the congestion of the traffic, is the traffic jam. And so we try to measure up what is the impact on economy. And last year in the US, people started to figure out and try to, to, to account for all the direct costs, the time loss, the fuel, but also all the indirect costs. And they came up with a bill of 300 billion per year in the US only last year. So it's, it's absolutely humongous. So when you talk about that type of money, people start to think about, about solution. But it's not only the US. We know that we have, for example, mega cities in China. We've got mega cities uh, everywhere. If you go to Sao Paulo, if you go to Jakarta, to Delhi, you spend hours and hours in traffic jam and you'll, and you'll want a solution. And this has a cost in terms of time. This has a cost also in terms of environment. I mean, we know that the cities are responsible for roughly 70% of uh, the, green, the global greenhouse gas emission, and so we need to take that number down. Obviously, the electric car that uh, uh, Francois was referring to, our solution, 
and we tend to believe that uh, there is another solution because if you look at cities today, it's clear that there's, there's very, very limited solution, I would say, on the surface. There's very limited solution below the surface. I mean, the subterranean uh, uh, around cities is, is, is also crowded. So we think what we need to do is really uh, uh, go for the third dimension. And, and because in the third dimension, by definition, is, is open and, and, and we have all the space we, we, need to do, we, we, need to, we need to do to travel uh, people there. So once we say this, how close are we to, uh, to urban air mobility and to this dream of, uh, of flying around? Well, from a technological standpoint, we're not very far. We identified the blocks, and these blocks were not necessarily together. But now we know that more and more they're getting together. And, and the challenge for us is how can we make a, a totally safe, uh, create a totally safe environment for those technology to interact and develop that capability. One of the blocks will be the batteries and the electricity, having the autonomy, having the power. But this is not so far away. Thanks to the automotive industry at large, this is progressing very fast. We're very confident we're going to get there. There are some new, new technologies, uh, like the sense and avoid. We see that with drones today. We see more and more drones around us, and we see that they use this type of technologies, which are actually usable and, and scalable. And then we have automation. I mean, uh, I cannot say I drove for 240 kilometers without touching my steering wheel, but um, actually aircraft had been landed uh, on full automatic since the 70s. Okay, you, you old flu aircraft, and these aircraft are landing very often in full automatic. When you have side wind of this type of thing, the, pilot, the pilots are instructed to actually uh, uh, land on full automatic. So uh, in, in the aviation business, automation is, is part of who we are for the past 40 years, and actually it increases safety. And so it's something we really uh, believe also could benefit uh, at, at a very large scale. So you asked me, Jim, also uh, on saying, okay, so the technologies were not very far, but there may be many players. Well, actually, yes, there are many players. There are dozens of small startups, small or big. And, uh, and uh, maybe you heard about Volocopter, about Ilium, about Ehang in China. What is interesting is these people raised last year only $400 million. Uber started to get into the game. Uh, Boeing just purchased a company named Aurora. Uh, uh, um, Agusta, Bell, the helicopters manufacturers, everybody getting into this game because we all start to believe it's not a dream, it's not something uh, that uh, our kids uh, should to dream of or, some, or see here or the, a science fiction movie. It's something that will fly probably in the next five years. And it will start to scale up. It will take time, a little bit like the, uh, the, like, like the car industry or aviation. It will take time, but again, in 10 years, 15 years, it'll be hopefully reasonably common. So. What are the challenges to, 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 to get there? Again, we mentioned vehicles and the technology, but honestly, vehicles may not be actually the biggest difficulty. The difficulty is, is integrating all the technology, not only on the vehicle, but on the ground, uh, in the space, work with the uh, authorities regulating traffic, uh, try to, to make sure that all of this is safe, because again, safety is paramount uh, for all in, in the aviation business. When we Many of you flew here. When you flew in, you didn't ask yourself, uh, when you landed, you didn't ask yourself, I'm there safe. You thought, you know, was the I know, uh, in, in flight entertainment nice? Was the service good? Was the aircraft on time? Nobody asked anymore the question, is it safe to fly? And, and nobody asked this question because the whole industry has been working 50 years to make it happen. And so it's paramount that, yes, we have many startups, but we, I mean, uh, private companies and the authorities and the regulators and the governments, we need to make sure that this uh, safety uh, priority goes also into urban air mobility despite the rush to get there because technologically it is, it is feasible. So that is a big thing. Another issue will be, the, of course, the business model. Uh, how does that work? Are the cities paying for part of it? Is it only the users? Who's going to pay? How is going to be paid? Is, is, obviously, is obviously a question. Another one, of course, is public acceptance. Are we today willing to go in an object with nobody at the steering wheel, which will take you 300 meters into the air and fly you to the other end of the, of, of the city? So we did, a, we did a study in three continents and, uh, and tried to get uh, the, uh, the opinion of people. And of course, it varies from one country to another, but mostly people really value uh, uh, time versus money, they need safety, 
and it is certainty. I mean, again, if you can say, wherever you are, in Delhi, in, uh, uh, again, in Sao Paulo, uh, or in Beijing, I can go to point A from point B, and I'm sure that it will take seven minutes, instead of, I don't know if it will take 20 or two hours, 20 minutes or two hours. That, that has a great value in and by itself. So we believe entropic acceptance, thanks to the move in the automotive now, is getting about not being piloted, apparently is getting more and more buy-in, in particular with the younger generation. So again, the idea is to work together with the authorities, uh, with, with the cities and the governments to, uh, to, 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 to make it work. So uh, this will bring what type of benefits? Because uh, obviously what we, what we believe is one of the limits to the um, extension of the cities are uh, that the center of the city is becoming very expensive and the time to commute is getting uh, uh, I mean, it's becoming a barrier to, uh, to the development of the cities and the development of the economies. We believe this could be one of the solutions. Again, it's certainly not the only one, but it certainly could be part of the solution. Again, we believe it will stop at a reasonably low number for really people traveling for business or very wealthy individuals, but very fast we could be in a position to move on to make it more affordable as we, as we scale up and see this something we believe in. Um, then again, uh, what we believe in terms of on the investment, it will be reasonably limited. I mean, compared to building roads, building trains, here we're talking about only building uh, launch pads in cities, so it's very limited in terms of real estate, very limited in terms of investment, but actually, yes, it could contribute to the economy of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the cities. Uh, also, uh, with the, we're talking about the internet and about, uh, uh, again, parcel, de parcel deliveries, and we believe, yes, also parcel deliveries by drones is something that's going to happen and develop uh, reasonably fast. So again, we, we believe this revolution is coming. We believe it's not a dream anymore. We believe it's something we work on. And actually, we, we do at Airbus have uh, two projects. Uh, one will fly next year, and one will fly in a couple of weeks. And so I, I couldn't resist uh, uh, to make some free advertising, sorry, uh, Thierry, and, and show you a little video with, uh, with, what, uh, with the uh, uh, the prototype that is going to fly in uh, in the Silicon Valley uh, in a coming uh, I mean in in a couple of weeks. So if you can see the video, please. Thank you. Uh, I confess I was a little worried uh, by beginning to say, in the beginning that I said that uh, the future is now, you just backed me up very nicely, and I appreciate that. Um, in the United States recently, um, I think many of us were a little shocked to learn how far 
or how much of our daily life depends now on space, on communications coming from space, on photography. After we had a series of devastating hurricanes, we learned that satellite photography had enabled the cities of Houston and other cities that were affected to uh, download photographs of the damage and save all the time and expense of having insurance adjusters go out to cite that damage. And it brought home the extent to which uh, space is important to us today in, in ways we don't understand as well as we should. And to solve that problem, we have Jean-Yves Legal, president of the Centre National de, des Études Spatiales, uh, to uh, walk us through it. Well, thank you. <coughs> Good afternoon. If we can skip the presentation, please. Yes. Uh, a few words, perhaps, about uh, to start about what you said uh, for uh, what happened in the U.S. and in the French West Indies uh, at CNES, which is a French space agency. We organize a shark to uh, be sure that when we have uh, hurricanes or um, earthquakes, all the satellites which are going to overfly these uh, regions in the hours after this big event, all the satellites are going to take picture of the ground. And this is why uh, after uh, the uh, big uh, floods in Texas, we got uh, radar images of the satellites allowing to see where there were a big flood and where there was a lot of water. And uh, in the French West Indies, we got uh, the first images from what happened in Saint Barthélemy and uh, Saint Martin to organize all uh, the uh, organization of the rescue. And uh, as you said, satellites are uh, very, very useful. But uh, today I'm going to speak about uh, another use of satellite, uh, which is uh, the use of the satellite to uh, allow uh, autonomous vehicles. And in particular, I would like to speak about uh, Europe's Galileo geolocation, which uh, will uh, enable such uh, autonomous vehicles in uh, the future. So uh, Galileo is today a constellation of uh, 18 satellites. So it means that uh, we have been launching during the last year the 18 satellites. And uh, it is uh, already uh, delivering promising levels of performance. And uh, it affords a much better precision than any other satellite and navigation system currently available. To be uh, very blunt, if you take the GPS, you know that you are uh, in uh, the Four Seasons here in Marrakech. If you take Galileo, you know if you are here on the stage or in the room. It's very, very important, and it makes, no, no, but it's the truth, and it makes the difference. And we are going to continue to launch satellites. The next one is planned uh, in French Guiana with an IN5 on the 12th of December. And so we will have the full constellation by 2020. And uh, there are four points on which I would like to insist to explain why Galileo is uh, such uh, a great asset for autonomous vehicles. The first point is uh, a service offering 10 meter accuracy around the globe. And uh, as I said, Galileo is even more accurate than the GPS. The second point is uh, an authentication service that allows users to ensure they are receiving the right signals and not being spoofed. It's very, very important, in particular, when you have to deal with insurance or to make, for instance, uh, uh, micro trading, to know exactly when some, uh, an event occurs with uh, an accuracy which is uh, something as uh, 1 over 10 minus, uh, uh, second, minus 9 seconds. The third point is uh, enhanced signals to assure better positioning resilience in urban environments because I spoke about, uh, of course, uh, um, um, positioning here, but uh, if you have skyscrapers and so on, it may be difficult. And so Galileo is very, very useful for that. And last but not least, it's uh, the uh, close interoperability with GPS designed into the system from the outside. And now I would like to say in a few words some of the key issues facing autonomous vehicles where Galileo is going to be instrumental. The first point, the first issue is uh, institutional and regulatory. Any discussion about the driverless vehicles is bound to touch on road safety. Today, safety, of course, is mostly in the hands of drivers. 
when you drive a car, you are in charge of the safety of the car. But tomorrow, we are going to see a new paradigm where safety will be assured by autonomous system. And for one of the main challenges ahead may seem something of a paradox as governments must both guarantee road safety and boost innovation. Cooperation between the public and private sector therefore appears vital to progressively build a regulatory framework that favors innovation while retaining tight control over safety. Driverless vehicles are also an international issue. It seems obvious, but uh, we have today international accords like uh, the Vienna and Geneva Conventions of road traffic, and they seek to improve road safety by harmonizing regulation in signatory nations. And work, of course, is underway to include autonomous vehicles in this international treaty, because once we have autonomous vehicles, it will be too late to change the regulation. And so it is why it, it is so important to start right now. The second issue is of a technological and industrial order. Fully autonomous vehicles are not going to start operating overnight. Industry plans to roll out solutions ranging from limited autonomy to full autonomy over more than 10 years. Today, five levels of autonomy have been standardized, level five being that of a fully autonomous vehicle. Driverless vehicles will need to be geolocated very precisely, and nowadays we are hearing that a vehicle's onboard positioning system must be accurate to within half the width of a drive, which is, let us say, 10 to 20 centimeters. It's very, very accurate, as a matter of fact, because you must have the same accuracy everywhere on the surface of the Earth. Positional accuracy is important, but so is positional integrity, which is the confidence we have in it. If uh, the system gives a position, but if you don't trust it, of course, it is completely meaningless. And uh, give, uh, even before technical solutions are matured, we need to address the issue of how driverless vehicles will be certified. It's another very, very important point, and it seems increasingly likely that we will adopt a building block approach focusing on subsystem level. It is clear that uh, although Galileo is a reality, we still have much work to, to perform to get its services into the architecture of vehicles, even if uh, it has been said on some vehicles, as Tesla, it is already very well mature. The last point is how industry organizes itself in this respect because uh, we need to have a very strong organization on the industrial side. Driverless vehicles are fueling fierce competition to develop new technologies in the automobile sector, especially with the arrival of the GAFA and uh, the data-driven culture that will be key to their development. In this context, most automobile manufacturers have decided to engage in this competition by nurturing their own ecosystem rather than going it alone. So, in a nutshell, you clearly understood that uh, autonomous vehicles are coming, but uh, it will be difficult, but I am sure that it will bring a lot of benefits. And uh, to conclude, I would like to say that uh, there is a strong need to conduct trials to allow industry to craft innovation for autonomous vehicles and to give governments enough data to inform policy decision and legislation. From this point of view, cooperation between the public and private sector will be a guarantee of success in this regard. I'm certain that uh, addressing this point, as uh, we are doing today very quickly, will be very, very helpful. But uh, on this point, as uh, on many other points uh, with innovation, things are going very, very quickly. And today, it seems uh, very strange to have a car driving alone, but I am sure that uh, within a few years, we will be able to drive, for instance, from Casablanca to Marrakech without driver. It will take just a few years. In the US, we start to have uh, some experimentations with some uh, social issues. In the US, uh, you have uh, 5 million of truck drivers. They clearly understood that uh, with such vehicles, they will lose their job but uh, such vehicles will bring a lot of benefits 
and this is exactly what is at stake. Thank you. Tony, thank you very much. For me. I have a couple of quick questions for each of you, but I wanted to see if any of you had questions for your fellow panel members. Uh, if not, I'll pass on. Francois, uh, the car has been a, both an instrument and a symbol of national power in the world. Uh, we're entering into new times and new equations for cars. Uh, are there countries or regions that have particular advantages that are likely to emerge at the head of the line for driverless cars, electric cars? And specifically, will the driverless electric car of the future be a European or a national product? No, it's a good question. When you look at the dynamic of the world right now, the most pushing country is China. China has technology at the scale. And China has a big issue because they're building the infrastructure for the, uh, for the country. And they don't want their economy to depend upon the price of oil. Elon Musk yesterday signed a huge agreement to build uh, another gigafactory to build not only the uh, Model 3, which will be uh, the mid-range car, but also uh, the battery. And they want, by uh, 2021, at least 25% of electric cars. So it's a political, regulatory, driven by the states. If you go to, to the US, it's a different equation. Uh, the US has won, have won the battle of internet, the cloud, and they, they're winning the battle of data. So there is two main things which gather data is first the car, because the car, when it's connected, tells everything about your life. Uh, what time you go to work, how you drive, um, they can hear you as well, so you need to be careful. And at home, that's why you have all those personal assistants popping up everywhere, because they will know at what time you go to bed, if you have a cat, how many kids, what you see on TV, what you talk about, and all the information will go into the cloud. And definitely, today, US is pushing very hard, but in terms of technology, the game of the US is to build an infrastructure in the cloud, which, which is mutualized, and the rest of the world try to connect to, uh, to the cloud. And they are very, very advanced right now. Europe is late. Europe is a me too uh, attitude. So they've tried to, uh, to create internet giant. They failed. On the cloud, I was chairman of the cloud research industry group for Nelly Cruz. And after three months, I said, dear Nelly, we lost the battle. And now for the data, they want to be part of the game in regulating um, and putting rules around, private, uh, around privacy. But if you close your world, you will not have, have access uh, to the services. The more you open yourself, the more access you have, the, the better service uh, you have. But coming back to what has been said by my uh, two colleagues, I'm very bullish of the future because with all the technology uh, um, uh, progress right now on the power of the chips, the power of the cloud, because you have trillion li lines of code that can be used everywhere uh, into the world, and the power also of the R&D that we have, you will see an exponential uh, progress in this industry very soon, and the future will be sooner uh, than expected, I think. I was stunned to learn the other day that China today manufactures more electrical vehicles than the rest of the world put together. It sounds like we're in for a repeat of what happened with uh, the digital information revolution where the United States exploited it. China decided to compete and capture, and Europe decided to accept and regulate. We may be back there. It's me too. <laughs> <laughs> Patrick. Uh, this coming world of swarms of drones delivering packages. I'm using journalistic hyperbole, but you'll put me in order. They won't want me. <laughs> and, and helicopter borne taxis. Uh, how well prepared are governments to begin to regulate that? Uh, is it at a, a point where they are already falling behind? Actually, it very much depends on, uh, uh, on the authorities you're talking about. Uh, obviously, the traditional one, like um, I'm talking about now aviation authorities, like the FAA in the US, like the ASA in Europe, they are very cautious. 
uh, and we believe rightly so. Uh, they are very close to us because they have the, a wealth of experience and for many years they've been, uh, they've been uh, certifying uh, 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 commercial aircraft manufacturers, helicopters aircraft manufacturers to carry people at very high altitude, very high speed. So they have to be careful. On, on I would say, younger economies, people are more bullish. Um, so some are still a little bit in a me too. I mean, for example, in Singapore, they're on the one hand very, very pushy to get the solution very fast, very early. But on the other hand, when you talk with them, say, well, we'll wait to see what the FAA is going to do, and then we'll kind of copy paste the FAA. Then we've got uh, the, uh, uh, the Gulf countries and, and the Middle East, and these are the most precious today. They really want a solution. They want to be the first one to have flying cars in their cities. It's a question of uh, national pride for them. So they're pushing hard. So I think here the regulators are almost asking uh, the industries, you know, how they can accelerate, what can they do. Uh, so it's not, so it's a little bit di different dynamic from the normal one, which is the industry pushing and the authorities uh, calming us down in terms of uh, ma making sure uh, everything is, 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 is done by the book. And uh, China, of course, is, uh, is a key player. It's the biggest manufacturer of drones today. They do like 80% of the drones flying. You've got companies uh, doing drones today that employ uh, 5,000 people that have research centers in Europe, in the US, uh, and they are very, uh, believe me, cutting edge technology. This is, what they do is extremely impressive. I was in Shenzhen a couple of weeks ago, meet with them. Uh, it's absolutely fascinating. So here the question on China is, are they going to leapfrog the helicopters? Because there are almost no helicopters, or very few helicopters in China. The question is, will they jump directly from having almost no helicopters to having Chinese flying cars, an electrical one? So, and it goes very well with, uh, indeed, as I said, we all know that uh, in certain countries are really pushing very hard for environmental matters for various reasons. And the Chinese do have a huge uh, pollution issue in, uh, in large cities. So yes, a huge pu uh, push on electrical, but there's also a push to uh, try to resolve the, uh, the traffic uh, issues they have. And uh, that could be one of them. And yes, they are, uh, they are very likely to be the first, either the Gulf or China will be the first place where it will go. And the limiting factor and the, the, the people deciding the timing won't be the industrials because we'll have solution fast. It will be the regulators. It'll be? The regulators. The regulators. Uh, Ron Eve, my question for you comes uh, on the governance side of this. Um, so much of our communications today pass through space, uh, including uh, in many countries, including my own, uh, a certain dependence on command and control systems of um, our nuclear forces and our communications with our military. Um, satellites are quite vulnerable to space attack, it seems to me, but perhaps you can enlighten us on that. Are governments beginning to figure out how to offer protection for the satellites that are off in space, and uh, how would they do that? Well, in fact, uh, you have a number of different satellites and uh, most of them are completely protected against uh, this kind of attacks. But of course, after that, it's a waste. You have a protection and the people uh, invent something else and so on. But uh, I am uh, sure that uh, if someone wants uh, really to attack a satellite system, it's probably easier to attack the software on ground than to attack the hardware in space. Because uh, we know that there are many, many cyber attacks and uh, it's probably easier than to attack satellites. But uh, we have satellites which, which are protected and uh, I do not know, and I think that it doesn't exist, an example of a satellite which has been attacked uh, from the ground. But it could happen in the coming years, but uh, there is a lot of protection and uh, I can tell you that it is not so easy to attack a satellite. It's very difficult. But I gather that in some countries, China is one example I hear cited, there is quite an effort underway to develop systems that can attack satellites. Yes, to develop systems. But uh, I do repeat, I think that it's much easier to do it on ground than uh, to do it in space because uh, without uh, entering into details, there are some other countries than China which develop uh, countermeasures to avoid such attacks. Well, I want to thank the panel for a really invigorating discussion that uh, has given you some inkling about what lies in wait for you 
and what the advantages and uh, dangers that technology brings to our modern world. And uh, so we end the session here. Thank you very much.